from KZ12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. All eyes on Hurricane Laura. This a live look from New Orleans this evening as that storm, a Category 4 hurricane, now making its way toward the Texas and Louisiana coasts. Yeah, again, this is a live look at New Orleans. Uh, which, you know, kind of went from a tropical, top, tropical summer day to this in the last 36 hours. Laura expected to make landfall late tonight or early Thursday morning, but what kind of punch will that storm have when it does? Adam Kasky standing by with the latest on Hurricane Laura. Adam. Yeah, and I want to point out New Orleans is going to be pretty far removed from the worst of this hurricane as it heads into the coastline later on tonight as a very strong category for real deal strong Call it catastrophic hurricane for those coastal communities. Category four right now, max sustained winds at 145 miles per hour with some gusts up to 175. This is going to hit later on tonight right along the Texas Louisiana state line with winds of about 150 miles per hour, some higher gusts around midnight 1 a.m. later on tonight. And that's basically Sabine Pass area in the Sabine River, uh, right where it feeds into the Gulf of Mexico here and head northward then right up the river through the night and into early morning tomorrow. And by tomorrow at midday, still a tropical storm. So some winds up to 70 miles per hour in northwestern Louisiana there. Of course, winds are a big factor with this. And let's take a quick look at the forecasted winds. This is just one of our uh, computer models that look at this and you get on into the nighttime hours, 11 p.m. Sabine Pass, 77 miles per hour. Look at that, 127 miles per hour by 1 a.m. there along the coast. And even Lake Charles is going to stand out here by 2 a.m. 127 mile per hour winds. OK, that's what's forecasted with this. We'll talk about the storm surge, which is going to be major as well coming up. All right, we'll see you in just a few minutes, Adam. Thank you. As residents of Port Arthur, Beaumont, other areas in Hurricane Laura's path are fleeing the coast. Many are coming here to San Antonio. Yeah, according to the San Antonio Fire Department, more than 2,100 people have come through the local processing center since yesterday afternoon. Our Garrett Berger joins us live from that location to tell us about the precautions the city is having to take to keep people safe during not one, but two emergencies. Garrett. Now this line of cars behind me actually stretches a full mile wrapping around the block all the way to Houston Street. All of these people evacuating from the Texas Louisiana state line area along the coast hoping to find shelter here in San Antonio. Now normally they'd be sent to, to mass shelters in places like warehouses or old retail space, big congregate settings. But this isn't just a hurricane. It's a hurricane during a pandemic and congregate settings like that are a great way to spread COVID-19. So instead evacuees are getting Getting put up in hotel rooms because of the pandemic. There are plenty of rooms to be had. Not a good thing during normal times in a tourism reliant city like ours, but handy at the moment. Because we're staying in in a individual hotel room with their families, there's not the need for the extreme precautions we would have to take if we were staying in a in a large warehouse facility. The fire department says they're screening people as they arrive at this processing center, and those who are coming in on buses should have been screened beforehand too, said a spokesman for the fire department, and there's space left between the people on board. Now, when they arrive, anybody who's symptomatic, if they need it, can end up going to the hospital. Now, while the hotel contracts are for either at least five nights or seven nights, depending on the location, the fire department spokesman says that people can leave before then. Whether they choose to do so, though, will likely depend on how bad Hurricane Laura hits the coast tonight. Live at Gembler Road, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. And as they get the vouchers, they show up at some area hotels, including this one. This is a live picture from Sky 12 over the Marriott Riverwalk, where you can see people are lined up outside waiting to get in to the Marriott shelter, I guess you would call it. A lot of people being put up in hotel rooms around the city. The Marriott Riverwalk seems to be one of the popular ones, and you can see people are lined up even outside of the carport there. So quite a line right now as we look live at downtown San Antonio. And of course, this storm already affecting a lot of people. It hasn't even made landfall yet. A lot more will be needing help in its aftermath. Much of that help will come from the Red Cross 
which is going to need more volunteers. Our KSAT community partners are teaming up with the Red Cross to get the word out. Right now, the nonprofit is looking for as many as 160 volunteers. To help out, you can fill out an application online. We have that information on ksatcommunity.com. If photos from a deadly deputy involved shooting have been released by Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar today, who says he is confident his deputies did everything in their power to avoid using deadly force. The shooting happened on Liberty Field on the far west side after deputies responded to a mental health call for a man who was behaving erratically. Salazar says these photos or hopefully you'll see these photos coming up show 31 year old Damian Lamar Daniels outside of his house with a gun and a holster in his waist. Apparently we're not going to see those videos. He also apparently had a knife and while Salazar was simply possessing the weapons wasn't an offense. Daniels was erratic grabbed at a deputy stun gun. Later on, the sheriff says Daniels reached for his own gun and that deputies struggled with Daniels over that gun for more than two minutes before a deputy shot him twice. Two veteran deputies and a trainee deputy have been placed on administrative leave before being placed on administrative duty as standard procedure. Two separate investigations are currently underway. Meantime, Bear County investigators looking for some leads as they search for whoever killed a man in West Bear County two weeks ago. The body of 33 year old Michael Delgado was found burning on the access road of Highway 90 back on August 9th. Investigators believe he was killed somewhere else, dumped there and then set on fire. Sheriff Javier Salazar says Delgado was no stranger to law enforcement. A motive for the killing is not yet known. Anyone with any information on this case is asked to call Crime Stoppers. That number is 210-224-STOP. And do it six in order to combat what he calls a shadow pandemic, the increase in domestic violence cases during the COVID-19 pandemic. County Judge Nelson Wolf has proposed the creation of a new specialty court. He cited an 18% spike in domestic violence cases this year as the reason. Paul Venema now with a look at what will be the protective order court. This is one of a dozen specialty courts in the county handling civil, criminal, and misdemeanor cases. County Judge Nelson Wolf wants to create another court dealing only with civil protective orders. We've seen a, a tremendous jump in the, in the protective orders that, are, that, that have been requested. Though he said the county budget this year is tight, Wolf has proposed setting aside $948,000 for the new court. It provides them with um, associate new, new judge, a court manager, program assistants, crime advocates, uh, all the backup support that they need to make the court work. Senior Civil District Court Judge Peter Sakai is a strong advocate of the new court, another weapon in the battle against domestic violence, he said. This was the county side uh, putting in its contribution on the prevention and on the fight to combat uh, domestic violence. So we're real pleased that the county embraced it. Sakai said he shares Judge Wolf's vision for the new court. Hopefully uh, uh, this will help us uh, stem this tide of, uh, of uh, domestic violence. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. You do it six right now. Seniors are having to do more online than just stay in touch with their grandkids. Many are asking a group called Senior Planet to teach them about online financial literacy, as well as scammers and hackers out there trying to steal their money. Jesse Degriata reports Senior Planet has seen interest increase, perhaps in part due to the recent uncertainty over mail delivery. No, ma'am, I did not. Not in, not in my lifetime. Did Brad Veloz think at 73 he'd be on Zoom, much less rely on his laptop to do most of his banking transactions? Something, again, that I, I didn't, I didn't even phantom it would happen in my lifetime. Like many seniors, he still uses the postal service, but Veloz says he trusts it'll function as it always has, despite the funding controversy in Congress. Online financial transactions have real benefits, Veloz says, but he and his spouse also realized the risks. I think it still continues to be a concern for us, but we, we feel pretty safe with how our transactions are, are being conducted online. Having transitioned from in-person classes to virtual learning, Senior Planet also understands those potential risks. So much so that Senior Planet created a coronavirus 
resource page just for financial security. Like what are the ins and outs of online banking? What sorts of frauds and scams that you should be aware of? If you're interested in knowing more about that subject matter, then we have individual classes on those topics. Now more than ever, they say Senior Planet's no-cost services are invaluable to others like Brad Veloz. I would urge them to really think about where we are today and what we're doing and what's happening um, in, in our lives. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Time saver traffic now. Let's go to the Trans Guide camera here at I-35 in Pine. You can see, looks like a, a truck there, an officer behind it, possibly a stalled vehicle right as drivers are getting on to 35 here. You can see traffic coming around the curve there. Looks a little heavy at 6 o'clock compared to what we've normally seen, but something for drivers to be on the lookout for here at I-35 at Pine. And outside of the Alamo City, a quiet day today. We have some high-level clouds that have been streaming overhead, and some of those fair-weather patchy clouds but unfortunately not producing much in terms of rainfall across South Texas today. As for the heat, well, today our high temperature, 98 degrees. That's three degrees above average, and the record, 102. That was set back in 2006. The Hurricane Laura, major hurricane, really not going to have an impact on us. As we go through the evening hours, temperatures gradually falling through the 80s. An isolated stray shower can't be ruled out at 10 to 20 percent chance of that. Otherwise, it's same old, same old around here, even through the day tomorrow. 77 in the morning, 98 in the afternoon with the partly cloudy sky. I'll have the comprehensive update on Laura coming right up. brings our total to 45,622 since the pandemic began. Our moving day average, our seven day moving average now is 137, so a nice drop there. We do have, unfortunately, uh, 13 new deaths to report tonight, bringing the total to 754. Uh, four of the 13 are the result of Metro Health reviewing those death certificates provided by the state and confirming that those deaths were in fact COVID-19 related. They, those occurred between June 21st and August 25th yesterday. And again, um, these represent our family members, our community members, uh, loved ones, neighbors, relatives, colleagues. So please keep them and, your family, and their families in your prayers. Tonight in our hospitals, we're reporting another drop uh, from yesterday, which is good. 436 people in the hospital, down 22 from yesterday. We're also down in new admissions to 31 since yesterday. 202 people on ICU and 134 on ventilators. All of these numbers are down, which is good news for our hospitals and good news uh, in the trajectory of this infection. And we want to keep it going that direction. But keep in mind, even though uh, we've seen those numbers trend in the right direction, our overall hospital system remains under high stress. Judge Wolf. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Mayor and I were out at the uh, Bear County grounds today, uh, the Coliseum and the arena, and uh, looking at the work that we're doing on the hurricane that's uh, about to hit, I think it's sometime maybe early in the morning up uh, by Beaumont area. But a lot of people are here already. Uh, and uh, the hotels are just uh, getting jammed up. Uh, there's traffic all over town with people trying to get in the hotel and then out at the uh, Coliseum grounds, there's a long line of cars that are signing up to be able to get vouchers for rooms. Uh, we're, we're fortunate the state and, and the um, federal government are, are paying for the rooms. And so um, it's very important that we do that. Uh, obviously, with the COVID overlying the uh, hurricane and people coming here, we don't want people congregating in certain areas. Another interesting aspect of it is, uh, as you well know, we set up a field hospital out at the Coliseum grounds, and uh, we thought we'd never have to use it, certainly not for the COVID as things went along, but uh, it's certainly being used now. Uh, BCFS runs that operation. And uh, we have something like 80 people there that have come from assisted uh, nursing home, assisted uh, living or nursing homes, and they have to have some medical care. Then we've got another 190 beds on a separate room right next to it where some of the family are staying. And I would assume we'll have more people staying out there. So we set it up for COVID, but it's certainly uh, paying a big uh, uh, benefit now by having it here. I think we've already had something like 1,600 people process through there uh, that have come here to San Antonio. 
Uh, we're also providing space in the Freeman Coliseum. Usually when, that, when the hurricane hits, they began staging uh, workers from all around the certain area, first responders, and uh, they'll be uh, staying in the Coliseum as they begin to respond to this, where they get their directions where they should go and who, sh who they should help. But uh, we're all working hard, a good city-county uh, effort to um, handle the people that will be coming in here and then having people that will go there as first responders. Right. Thank you, Judge. Yeah, and this has turned into a major event literally uh, within hours, so glad we have uh, folks ready and prepared and dealing with the situation as we speak. As always, you can get the latest on COVID-19 in our community by texting COSAGOV to 55000. You can also go to the website anytime at covid19.sanantonio.gov. Interesting listening to Judge Wolf there talking about the fact that there are some 80 people who, if I understand him right, are staying at the Freeman Coliseum in medical beds that they thought they would have to use for some COVID patients, but actually are being used from people who have evacuated from the coast here and need medical attention. And then some of their relatives are also allowed to stay uh, in an adjoining room uh, out there at the Freeman Coliseum and also a staging ground for a lot of the first responders who will be going to the coast. Most of those 80 patients, people who have been in assisted living facilities or nursing homes that have had to be evacuated along the coast. As far as our local numbers here today, they continue to go in the right direction. Uh, 134 new cases reported. That seven day rolling average is down to 137 uh, cases per 24 hours. That is a steady decline over the last week or so. 13 new deaths reported, but four of those were deaths that did con uh, occur between June 25th or June 21st rather and up until yesterday. But certainly Hurricane Laura adding to the already uh, intense challenges of responding to COVID-19. Yeah, and let's check in with Adam Kasky right now for the very latest on Laura and kind of the areas. I mean, it really Lake Charles seems to be and Sabine Pass seem to yeah. be the couple of places that are really going to take the brunt of this one. Yeah, Sabine Pass, Port Arthur area, and especially into Lake Charles, Louisiana. And then as you go eastward along the Louisiana coastline because of the storm surge, and we're going to talk about that storm surge in one second here. You know, we had a few showers work their way through the Houston area. Some of our eastern counties, Lavaca County, DeWitt County, Goliad had some rain earlier today. That was it from Laura spiraling on the far outer fringe of that now major hurricane. I mean, we're talking category four with some max sustained winds of 145 miles per hour, making landfall late tonight around 1 a.m. Basically right at Sabine Pass, where the Sabine River feeds into the Gulf of Mexico. Now keep in mind on the right side of these storms relative to the motion, that's where you have that onshore flow and that's where you get the greatest storm surge and also some of the uh, the more dynamics in terms of winds and you can get little tornadoes to spout up as well. So let's talk about the winds. First of all, we go into the evening hours. They gradually pick up 11 p.m. 77 miles per hour. Sabine Pass, Beaumont about 51, Lake Charles gusting to about 70 miles per hour. Then we get to 1 a.m. and you're looking at about 130 miles per hour, I think at least around Sabine Pass and even Lake Charles as we get into the very early nighttime hours. Now this will weaken as it goes northward, but folks even in Kirbyville in East Texas could see some winds over 100 miles per hour later on tonight. Okay, and even extreme western Louisiana. I mentioned the storm surge, so we're talking 15 to 20 feet here east of Sabine Pass, and then it recedes a little bit as you farther get eastward, but this is 15 to 20 feet. That's the level of the water above the normal predicted tide. So say your normal predicted tide for that time would be here. Well, you'd be 15 to 20 feet above that in terms of the water level, which of course can have devastating impacts on any structures. We're gonna have another update coming up in a little bit, but I do wanna point out around here, it's more of just the same. Yeah, we're in the 90s right now, tomorrow, upper 90s, an isolated shower or two, but completely unrelated to Laura, just your typical pop-up garden variety activity. Not much hope for a whole lot of rain coming down the line here, just sunshine, passing clouds and near 100. You know, you talked about this is going to hit really at the Texas Louisiana line. Mm -hmm. Our Justin Horn is down there. We'll hear from him coming up a little bit later. All right. For now, sports is coming up next.
The Milwaukee Bucks decided to boycott Game 5 today with the Orlando Magic to protest the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin. The game was scheduled to tip around 3.10 local time. Orlando took the floor for warm-ups while the Bucks remained in their locker room. Bucks guard George Hill told ESPN's Mark Spears that they're tired of the killings and the injustice. Not long after that, players from the Thunder and Rockets and the Blazers and Lakers also decided not to play. The NBA has since postponed all three games and said Game 5 of each series will be rescheduled. Houston Texans sent players and staff home early today with Hurricane Laura looming. They close NRG Stadium around 2.30 this afternoon. The team will meet virtually Thursday morning and reassess if it's safe to return for the scrimmage scheduled for Thursday evening. Bill O'Brien said his team needs this scrimmage, but the preseason canceled. What's best for our team is to have two of these scrimmages, you know, at least one of these in full pads where you know, we warm up like a game. Uh, we treat it as much like a game as we possibly can. Coaches in the press box and kind of go through all that, the, the, the um, you know, basically the, the logistics of a game. And so, uh, you know, we're going to try to do, we're going to try to keep it for Thursday. Obviously, if the weather affects that, we'll just move it back. We'll figure out another day to do it. On Sunday, J.J. Watt tweeted a picture of Shipley Donuts box with a note saying from the Rooks. J.J. said, you know, the rookies did something wrong. Well, rookie Ross Blacklock was asked to explain what happened. Uh, so we supposed to order Kata Robata for the vets, me and another rookie. It was just miscommunication with the vets and the rookies and the, the rookies took the L, so we bought JJ and them donuts that next morning to try to make it up. Kind of like a bringing your girlfriend flowers after y'all got in an argument. <laughs> so that's kind of what that situation was. But unfortunately, we're still going to have to get the food. Oh, those rookie mistakes can be costly. Kata Rabata is a sushi and Japanese small plates restaurant in Houston. Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones is happy that his team will get to play in front of fans this season at AT&T Stadium. The NFL has not instituted a league-wide attendance policy in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, and as a result, 23 NFL teams will not have fans in the stadium for at least the season opener this season. The Cowboys are not one of them. Jones confirmed he was given the green light by Governor Greg Abbott. Meanwhile, down in Florida, the Miami Dolphins plan to allow 13,000 fans for their home opener with the Buffalo Bills. So, Jerry was asked if it's fair that some teams can have fans while others can't. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the benefit of crowds are, are uh, important to sports. On the other hand, uh, uh, is it possible to have great games without it? We saw one the other night in basketball. So, um, uh, but it's uh, fair. We've, we've made our minds that uh, this thing isn't going to be uh, one way or the other surely about uh, evening up everything that could be uh, competitive. How many fans the Cowboys will have for their home opener on September 20th is still to be determined. Currently, the state of Texas will allow up to 50% capacity for sporting events. Seem, that seems like a long ways away. It does. Like a lot it? could happen between now <sighs> and September 20th. Uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Larry. You got it. Coming up next, we're going to check in with our Justin Horn, who is out in the storm chaser tracking Hurricane Laura along the Texas Louisiana line. I want to show you a live camera not right now and not many people on the Galveston seawall as Hurricane Laura makes its way towards the Gulf Coast. No people, a little bit of traffic out there, just wave after wave cresting just offshore as the storm churns through the Gulf. Most of those vehicles you see lined up there, those are media vehicles tracking this storm and its effects. A much different picture than what we saw yesterday about this time. We could see the dark clouds moving in, but we could also still see some sunshine. Now the Gulf Coasts of East Texas and Louisiana are bracing for a dark and stormy night. Yeah, and we, we showed you earlier how San Antonio is pitching in to help those who decided to evacuate. Other cities doing the same thing, but not everyone is getting out of the way of this storm right now. Longtime locals, they know the drill by now, and the ones who have stayed behind either feel like they can ride this one out or like they don't have a choice. Meteorologist Justin Horn and photojournalist Bill Caldera making their way east along I-10 all day long, showing us how the people staying put are bracing for Hurricane Laura. 
Windows boarded up, coastal towns seeing people flee from the dangerous conditions ahead. Places like Port Arthur are preparing for the worst with evacuations underway. Still, mm, just don't feel like ass. evacuating. Too much anxiety with it. I just rather stay home. COVID-19 is also now an added problem. The main concern is, you know, trying to get out and get stuck in traffic somewhere where we can't yeah. get any further and depending on somebody else and being crowded in with a bunch of people that's got COVID. A staging area in Beaumont at the Ford Arena has brought first responders from across the state, including San Antonio, ready to launch into action with Laura likely to bring devastation to parts of Far East Texas. Meantime, in the other city of the Golden Triangle, Orange, some residents here are also choosing to stay. Uh, we're just going to hunker down. We've got fuel, we've got generator, food, water, just hunker down. It's an area that has been battered by a barrage of storms over the last 15 years. We went through Rita in 05. We went through Ike in 08. Add Harvey and Imelda to the list, too. And I've been here 55 years all my life, and I've never seen the flooding as I've had in the past 15 years here. So we're just going to put it to the test, see what it does. And we've been very surprised as to how many people are choosing to stay here in Orange tonight. Despite those mandatory evacuations, things will get worse as we get into tonight. Winds could gust as high as 100 miles per hour here, and we'll be bringing you live coverage. Guys. Justin, I know this is a question you're probably going to hear all night and into the morning, but I mean, what are you seeing there as far as changes? Are you seeing anything change over the last few hours that let you know, okay, Something's coming. Well, we got a rain band earlier. It brought some good rain. With those rain bands, you always see the winds pick up. So we saw a little bit of that. Right now, still fairly calm. We've got some rain clouds, though, off in the distance. And we know that that first band, that first sort of wave, is not too far away. This hurricane is only about 115 miles. At least the, the eye of the hurricane is only about 115 miles from where we are now. And so I'd say over the next few hours, we're going to start to see things uh, get worse. What do we think the biggest threat from this storm is going to be? We know that Harvey, when it, it got here to Texas, it just parked over Houston and dumped so much rain. So what are the biggest uh, threats of Laura going to be? Well, where we are, we are somewhat concerned about storm surge, and it often depends on which side of the storm that you're on. We think the storm surge will be bad here, but probably worse further up the coast in Louisiana. The winds will be very strong here, and there are a lot of trees. Those trees can fall on houses and do a lot of damage. Power lines, we're expecting power lines to go down. Water could be cut off. All things people need to keep in mind if they're choosing to stay. All right, thank you, Justin. We'll be checking back with you through the night and into tomorrow as well. And, you know, he talked about that right side of the storm. That's where the worst part is because of the storm surge. And I'm going to break that down for you here in one moment. I want to start with the big picture. You can see now the eye of the hurricane well within radar range. And so you can see the center of circulation and the most intense rain starting to creep its way onto the Louisiana coastline and also the outer bands that Justin was talking about that moved through his area earlier today. All right, here are the latest stats on Hurricane Laura, still category four storm, max sustained winds 145 with some gusts up to 175. So we're talking big major hurricane here making landfall around 1 a.m. Basically along the Texas and Louisiana line, the Sabine River there, Sabine Pass area and Lake Charles, Louisiana, Port Arthur, that whole general area around midnight 1 a.m. later on tonight into the early morning hours tomorrow. Going right up the Sabine River, basically in extreme eastern Texas and western Louisiana as it dissipates into a tropical storm by midday tomorrow. So it's still going to have a big impact in communities that are right along the Texas and Louisiana state line because it's still going to pack a big punch as it heads northward, as I showed you earlier in terms of those wind gusts that we're expecting even in the Kirbyville area of over 100 miles per hour in East Texas. All right, so let's talk about the rainfall. That's that was the big factor with Harvey is this the, the Harvey just sat and rained for a while. Of course, it had strong winds along our coast. But this is actually going to be a progressive storm. It's still going to dump a lot of rainfall. I mean, we're talking probably 10 inches plus around the center of that storm where it makes landfall Lake Charles area up toward Burkeville. But then that rainfall 
really falls off quickly as you head westward. Even Houston, maybe just getting an inch or so of rainfall around here. I don't think we'll see anything from Laura. Uh, just a few isolated pop up showers completely unrelated tomorrow. OK, storm surge. Here's what I want to point out. Storm surge, you look at to the west side, the left of the center. It's not quite as bad as it is to the right of the center. You look uh, the center line here just to the right of it, 15 to 20 feet. You get to the left of it, 12 to 15, and then it drops to six to nine before you get to Galveston. But that right side, those numbers are a lot higher because on that right side of the storm due to the counterclockwise circulation, that's where it pushes more water inland. In terms of storm surge, this is a good example of what it actually is. And basically it's the rise of water above the normal tide for that given time. So a weak storm will just have a little bit of a surge. You'll see the water come up a little higher than usual on the beach. You get into moderate storms. It starts creeping into some structural areas. Then you get into the big hurricanes like we're dealing with here with Laura, and that can be the water rise of 15 to 20 feet above the normal tide. So where the normal tide would be later on tonight at midnight, well, the water on that right hand side of the storm could be 15 to 20 feet higher than that typical level. So that's uh, one of the most devastating parts of hurricanes. It's the brush of water coming in from the sea rather than just the rainfall or even the immediate winds. But of course, with this, the winds will be around 115 miles per hour where it makes landfall. Hey, around here, this is another typical day today, right near 100. Uh, we made it to 98 in San Antonio. Right now we're at 94. Del Rio hanging on to 103 at this hour. Quiet this evening. We'll be falling through the 80s tomorrow. You know, maybe an isolated shower, especially east of town. Then tomorrow, a 30% chance. And that's basically just the typical pop-up afternoon showers here and there. And into the weekend, Friday in the weekend, about a 10% chance. I'm not even bothering to put it on the seven day forecast. If we're lucky, we'll see something pop up. But overall, more of the same, upper 90s near 100 and partly cloudy. That depiction of the storm surge, that's such a good explanation of what people along the coast are going to be dealing with over the next couple of days. Yeah, absolutely. All right, our live KSAT Q&A with Mayor Ron Nuremberg is up next. Time now for today's KSAT Q&A. Every Wednesday we are joined by San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg. He is with us again this evening. Mayor, thanks for being with us. We've talked a lot in this show about the threat of Hurricane Laura and how we already have more than 2,000 people here in San Antonio who have evacuated seeking shelter from that storm. We're doing this amidst a pandemic. So what are the challenges and what's being done to keep these people safe, but also at the same time to prevent the spread of COVID? Yes, well, thank you, and, and it is certainly a challenge unlike we've seen before, primarily because our role in hurricanes is really to help with the uh, evacuation process and also with the disaster response. That comes next, but the evacuation process is, is unlike anything we've ever seen, primarily because we're trying to keep people separated. Usually we have a shelter facility we can put, we can take in as many as we possibly can, uh, and and we're good to go. Right now, we're having to shelter people in, you know, in units in their own isolated rooms so that they're not congregating together. That's proving to be a challenge. In addition to the fact that there's a much more laborious uh, screening process to get through before we send folks off to the hotels. How is there a max capacity for how many people we can take in here in San Antonio? This is very difficult to, to put a finger on, primarily because we have thousands of empty hotel rooms in this in this city. What we don't have necessarily, though, are fully operational hotel rooms because so many the, the hotels have not been operating. So we've been working literally within the last few weeks to prepare. Uh, and we also have now uh, overnight because of the surge of evacuees that the state and, and locals were not connected on and did not expect uh, due to the ma the massive uh, mandatory evacuations that have now occurred. Uh, we're working to scale those up. So we have we have capacity now. That's not an issue. That what's taking a while is to get through that screening process and get people registered and into those hotels. And I'm guessing a, a follow up to that with the screening process is you were screening them for where they would be best suited to go to, but also probably you know they have to go through some COVID 
tests, I'm guessing, uh, you know, yeah. temperature checks, that kind of thing before they're taken to a hotel or before they can go to a hotel. Yeah, it's a, it's a basic medical screening to see if there's any kind of medical assistance needed, you know, whether you're, you're a, a patient who's on dialysis or you're a patient who's having, you know, uh, you know uh, respiratory symptoms, that sort of thing. Uh, and then you go through the registration into the hotel. Uh, that, that takes some time. We also have to make sure that we know who is where because this isn't going to be over in 24 hours. Folks are not going to be able to access certain locations for maybe days uh, or potentially even longer. So we've got to be prepared for all of that. All right, Mayor, we want to turn to COVID-19 here specifically in San Antonio. We do need to take a quick break. Stick with us if you can, and we'll be right back. Right. We're continuing our Q&A today with Mayor Ron Nirenberg. Let's talk about COVID-19 specifically here in San Antonio. The numbers continue to trend in the right direction. You showed that model yesterday during the daily briefing that said that if we keep up what we're doing, uh, we might be able to avoid another fall surge. But we're also headed towards Labor Day and likely the return of in-person learning for a lot of schools. So with all of those numbers headed in the right direction, but with those things also in mind, what's your message to San Antonians right now? Keep up the great work. Uh, there are certain inconveniences that we're going to have to live with and the public health professionals have been talking about for quite some time until we actually get a vaccine. And those are very simple things to do in the grand scheme of things, considering how much of a, a toll this has taken uh, psychologically, economically and, and socially and everything else in our country. So wear a mask if you leave your house maintain physical distance from folks where, that are not part of your household and avoid large, large crowds. Um, if we do those things, yes, they're inconvenient. Yes, we're gonna have to modify some of the things that we enjoy during this fall uh, period of time, uh, but we'd be able to get through this without seeing the massive spike that we saw in July and not putting further stress and potentially breaking uh, the capacity of our hospital system. How concerned are you about Labor Day? I am concerned uh, because, you know, the model is one thing. A model, model is just a forecast, not unlike a hurricane model or a weather forecast. It uses a set of assumptions and tells us where we think we will be uh, in, in a few days or in this case, a few weeks or a month. Uh, all those things are based on behaviors. And, and if for some reason we just decide, you know, we, we don't have to do what we've been doing over the last few months, to really scale back this infection, then who knows what the forecast will turn out to. And, and, and likely it will be what we saw before, which is that cases will accelerate. We're gonna put a lot of strain on our medical system and, and we're gonna be right back where we were, uh, you know, a couple of months ago looking at things shutting down. And we don't want to have that happen. We were just looking at some pictures from the big crowds we saw over Memorial Day. Hopefully, uh, we have all learned a lesson since then. Mayor Nirenberg, thanks so much for being with us this evening. We'll see, you on, the, great evening. We'll see you on the night be tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. In case you missed it, coming up next. What started as an expectation to help maybe a few hundred evacuees it quickly turned into more than a thousand people seeking shelter in San Antonio throughout the night. Normally in evacuations like this, people would be set up in mass shelters like houses or a retail space. But because of the COVID-19 pandemic, they're doing the hotel rooms. One pair we talked to was just arriving today. They had tried the Houston area first, but had heard there were some evacuations around there too. We got family out here and they was telling us to come out here because they was giving free rooms. So try and get a free room, man, and stay out the way of this Laura hurricane. San Antonio police and SWAT team were called out to a standoff on the northeast side late last night. But after over three hours, police went inside that apartment that they thought the suspect was barricaded in, and there was no suspect to be found. The scene was shortly cleared after that around 1240 last night. As for what we know about the victim, he is a man, but police didn't release his age. His condition is still not known at this time. The search might be over for 23 year old Elder Fernandez, a Fort Hood soldier reported missing last week. The Fernandez family attorney says yesterday a body was found hanging from a tree in Temple. The 23 year old's driver's license found in a backpack. 
Over the weekend, we learned Fernandez had transferred units after recently reporting sexual assault. An autopsy has been ordered. Some 3,600 Texas teachers are getting a boost thanks to the teacher incentive allotment passed by legislators back in 2019. Rural districts and those with lower student socioeconomic status are favored. The goal is to help poor and lower school districts retain the best teachers. As people along the Texas and Louisiana coast getting ready for Hurricane Laura to make landfall, the Red Cross is getting ready to help out in the aftermath. Kay said and our community partners will be holding a Hurricane Laura relief phone bank this Friday. It will run all day from 9 in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. Volunteers will be taking your monetary donations to help people affected by this storm. We'll have the phone number for you to call on air and online tomorrow. And the Red Cross also still looking for volunteers. If you're interested in that as well, contact the Red Cross. Yes, we also have the application on our website as well. All right, let's take a look at the forecast winds later on tonight. So you go from now six o'clock and we advance this to let's say stop this at midnight and Sabine Pass there right along the coast. 116 miles per hour, I think at least at that point. And then we get up to about 130 or more miles per hour by 2 a.m. Lake Charles and Sabine Pass. Around here, little to no impacts. It's more of the same. All right, thanks, Adam. Thanks for watching the news at 6.